This brings us um, to uh, the final panel uh, discussion that we will have uh, for today. Um, and the focus of this panel discussion is strategies and approaches to landing the Blue Economy Research Program for enhanced utilisation of marine resources. And uh, first up to speak to us is uh, Dean Spicer. Dean um, is the Head of Sustainable Finance for ANZ um, and has spent over 25 years in financial markets covering equity funds, management and debt capital markets in New Zealand, the UK and Europe. At ANZ, he has been Director of Credit Sales and Trading and the Head of Capital Markets. His current role as Head of Sustainable Finance sees him supporting the development of uh, the Aotearoa NZ Sustainable Finance Market. He was also part of the Aotearoa Circle Sustainable Financing Working Group, Finance Working Group um, in 2021 and is currently a member um, of the Centre for Sustainable Finance Banking Implementation Group. Welcome to the stage. I'm too scared to touch the microphone now. Uh, I'll do it that way. Tēnā katoa katoa, ko te arua, te pā moanga, ko akatawa, te awa, no Otipoti aho, ki te awa kairangi, ki atu toko kainga, hi tu tu poutia, Takumahi, Cordine Spicer, Toko Noah, and it's a, a real privilege to be here. And um, I've really enjoyed, I, I had the invitation from uh, Tony and Catherine to join their group. Um, and I must admit, uh, I've uh, learned a lot, and I think uh, I've learned a lot more than what I've been able to give back. So thank you for the, for the working group for that opportunity. Um, I thought it was really interesting listening to uh, the discussion this morning, but also just now around uh, the green economy principles. And I say that because um, my role in sustainable finance at the bank is really looking at how can we use financing to drive better outcomes and more sustainable outcomes. And in fact, um, one of the things that strikes me is that we have within uh, the global sustainable finance market these principles, what we call green bond principles. And uh, those, while they're called green bond principles, they also envisage financing that supports um, the blue economy. Uh, in fact, the principles refer to financing for terrestrial um, aquatic biodiversity conservation, including protection of coastal marine and, and watershed environments as things that this finance can be used for. So it seems that there's a real alignment going on already in terms of what's proposed here around the blue economy, economy principles and the global marketplace that's developing to support these types of uh, impacts. So look, um, I thought that was really encouraging, um, and look, I thank you for the opportunity to be here, and uh, look, um, I'll stop there, um, other than to say that I also felt that, you know, the, the words of wisdom coming out of the panel this morning, I thought uh, uh, Tarmac Solomon, when he talked about the need for balance, uh, some of the thinking that I was uh, having as I prepared for this today um, was exactly that, you know, somehow we've got to make sure that we get it back into balance. Um, so, uh, look, that really spoke to me, so thank you. Thanks, Dean. Look, next up we've got Stu Yorston. Uh, he is the GM Sustainability and Marketing for Sea Lord. Um, he is responsible for the Sea Lord Group's marketing function and its grown focus on sustainability, including its response to climate change. Stu has had a 20-year career across marketing, working on FMCG and Bear brands uh, with Unilever and Lion in both New Zealand and Australia. Uh, and leading marketing and buying uh, with the warehouse. Um, big round of applause uh, for Stu. Yeah, that, was, that was straight off my LinkedIn profile. Um, well done. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, no ingi rangi, no airangi hoki oku tupuna. 
Okay, tamake, tamaki makaro aho e noho a, a, ana ko nati titiri aho ko stu toku ingawa. Um, so yes, I'm I'm been a seal for 11 years. <coughs> I've just picked up uh, sustainability in the last two and a half years, specifically outside of our fishing um, business, because that's been part of our core DNA since we started in 1963 in terms of how we fish, where we fish, and, and the like, and the species we catch. My role, um, uh, probably around 40% of it, is how we adapt and transition our way with all the climate risk that's going to come at us. And a, an observation I'd have is one of the things we haven't talked a lot about today is some of the scenarios that are going <coughs> to, excuse me, roll out in terms of uh, climate risk within New Zealand. Um, particularly um, warming water and the impact that's going to have. And I did note some saying that um, a, a mussel farmer won't, won't take $2,600 a tonne for seaweed. And it may be that uh, he doesn't have mussels growing on his lines in 10 or 15 years' time, so he may want to think about having seaweed on his lines in the short term because it was a real opportunity. Um, Sea, uh, sea Lord's uh, purpose or mission or vision, or we want to call it, is to do right by um, our whanau and the environment and, and to bring uh, quality sea field to the world. And uh, that is at the core of what we're trying to do. Um, we are a commercial fisher. We, we acknowledge that we do have some environmental impact uh, when we bottom trawl, and, and until there's a better technology around that, we will continue to do that, but it is a, a, uh, in a, a very, very small part of the ocean. And um, our goal is really to not only feed the world, because we feed everyone from Cameroon uh, to Nigeria to Japan to the US, as well as a lot of people in New Zealand. And in terms of giving back, uh, which I, one of the things uh, someone said, I said, what are the big companies doing? Uh, half of our dividend goes back into iwi um, and to fund communities uh, around New Zealand. So um, I think that from a, from, a, from a sea lord perspective and how we are involved in the blue economy, we are intrinsically aware of the role we play. I'd like to see more stuff around what's happening in the deep sea environment. There's a lot of inshore activity within the, uh, the studies I've seen, a little bit harder in the deep sea, but equally it is an area where we want to be seen to be um, adding more value to, uh, to the products we, uh, we catch. Um, anyway, I'll take some questions as we go forward. Thanks. Thanks, Stu. Our last panellist is Eva Shafiska, Assistant Manager, Sustainable Value um, with KPMG. Eva completed her PhD at the Institute of Marine Science at Auckland University. Currently working for KPMG, helping clients understand the risks associated with climate and biodiversity crisis, as well as the opportunities for creating a sustainable and beyond sustainable future for Aotearoa. No mai haere mai ki te ata mira Eva. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko tēnei waiwa no Legnita, Poland, ko tēnei waiwa no Aberystwyth, UK, ke roto au ita Sustainable Value tima, he Assistant Manager ahau o KPMG Inoa, ko Iva ahau, no reira tēnā koutou katoa. So my name is Eva. Uh, I am with KPMG. Um, my role is assistant manager at the sustainable value team at um, KPMG Auckland um, in Tamaki, Tamaki Makaura. Um, this event is really special to me because um, I've been, since I came to New Zealand, I've been with a challenge uh, from, from the beginning. So um, back six years ago, before I joined uh, or I came to New Zealand, I remember myself sitting at my desk at, in the UK when I was considering like, what is my next career step that I'm going to take? And this had led me to this exciting opportunity here uh, with you guys uh, in New Zealand to do my PhD at the Institute of Marine Science um, 
And without hesitating, uh, I came over and I stayed and I consider New Zealand being my home. So um, I've been involved with the challenge since the phase one and this is when I completed my PhD. Uh, which was very ecology-centered. So I was studying um, different organisms that live in our Australian systems, and thinking of them as how do they contribute to different ecosystem functions, and how do, I, do they contribute to different ecosystem functions at the same time, um, and how that translates to ecosystem services. So it was very ecological uh, kind of episode that I had during my career. And then it's... Um, it's continued being my passion, so I've pursued that, and I started my postdoc uh, with a phase two of the challenge, with a degradation and recovery um, theme, um, where I studied modeling restorative economies, uh, focusing on the community-based restoration projects. Um, and as I was in that research for around one year, Everything that I was researching has led me to the doors of the private sector that to me was a big mystery um, and black box that I was really keen to unpack. And this is how I got my role at KPMG. Uh, so now I'm proud to say that I'm supporting our clients with that you know, extremely complex uh, transition into more sustainable future. And although our work right now is focused on climate, we are also trying to tap onto the nature space uh, just because we recognize how important it is. And obviously, um, we can't achieve great nature outcomes without considering the great role of the oceans that they play um, in our economy and our well-being. In terms of some of the key outcomes that I've picked uh, during today's morning sessions and yeah, late um, lunch sessions. Oh, sorry, did you hear me before? Like, I was just, like, yeah, cool, okay. Because now <laughs> I can keep talking. I don't have to repeat everything from the beginning. Okay, because now I can hear myself much louder. So I don't know if this is better. Can you give me a thumbs up? Okay, cool. Um, so I wrote myself a sentence based on some of the things that um, were articulated here from, from this podium. And one thing that I wrote down in my little box um, for the reflections from the morning sessions was that achieving sustainable and beyond sustainable seas will require enhanced multi-sectorial collaboration under strong Te Ao Maori leadership. Um, the other interesting observation I had was that we started actually shifting the narrative around how we talk about the extraction of the natural resources and we no longer just talk about taking, but also replenishing and actually, you know, making that positive change as we sort of rely on the extraction of natural resources as well. Um, I really loved what Julie said at the beginning that, and this is the part that I'm mostly excited and passionate about, that we are going to be working towards making that knowledge of the challenge accessible to uh, its users. So hopefully this is some something that we as KPMG can help with bringing that knowledge to our client and making it uh, or translating it to come up with really um, grant breaking solutions uh, and really restoring the health of our oceans. Kia ora. adding in some of your reflections from this morning as well. Um, so we've had a couple of conversations um, leading up to this that have um, highlighted a couple things. Um, one in particular is that we find um, when we have conversations in separate arenas that we often use different language um, and that the communication gap often between research and the commercial sectors um, can create unintentional barriers. And so um, one is to make sure that this conversation is one that we um, uh, can fully immerse ourselves in. And so I'm kind of putting that out there as, as something that I've tried to become incredibly conscious of because the biggest opportunity as well is you hear all of these different avenues that are setting a path for blue economy um, for Aotearoa. 
how do we keep them moving forward? And that takes us, as Ava said, into a very, very collaborative space in communication and trust are key to good collaboration. So um, what I might do is we've got a couple questions um, to work through and then we'll click over to Slido. So if there's anything that you have as well as from earlier, for anybody in particular, add their name to it. Otherwise, we'll throw everything up to the whole panel. So. Um, you all get to work in kind of the cold face of this transition that we're talking about within the blue economy. Um, how do you see some of what we've been talking about today, or even the principles that we've presented, coming to life on that day-to-day -day level within either your businesses or within your customers? Do you want to start, Dean? I was afraid to say that. Um, <laughs> Thank God. I, I was actually at a, an event last night, and they said storytelling is important, and then um, uh, there's a, a poem to live it. So I came with a poem in case I couldn't answer the questions later on. So yeah, I've got that in my sleeve. Look, I think, um, I think it's quite exciting where we're at the moment. There seems to be a, a whole lot of things coming together. And the event that, that we're at last night, some, some of you may have been there, uh, the Aotearoa Circle was mentioned, and they actually had Chapman Tripp present on a legal opinion which is really looking at um, the, the, uh, the duties of directors to take into consideration uh, nature and biodiversity. And so um, uh, you know, I think we're already challenged by trying to work out uh, 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 how to account for carbon and, and obviously trying to then measure and account for our impact on nature is, is a whole other level of complexity. So, um, but I think that's where our, our worlds are going to collide. It's going to be around uh, the, the need to be able to capture better data uh, that data is going to be crucial if we want to understand the impact we're having. Um, and so while we're probably coming from these things in, 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 in different directions, um, I can see that the, this whole area of the need to collaborate and uh, work on these issues together is, is, is absolutely vital. So um, you know, I like to sort of think of the work we do is, is really around um, trying to incentivise uh, impactful outcomes, you know, uh, and to do that you need science and, and, and you need the, and then it has to be principle based as well. So, look, I, I can see a lot of crossover from the conversations that I've been having. Um, I'm also a little bit daunted by the complexity uh, that is involved in trying to understand uh, how to uh, better measure and model some of these, some of these aspects. Yeah what he said. Um, no, I, I, I think that, um, I mean, we, Sea Lauder, we're, we're already in the blue economy, so we're, we're out there, we're out there fishing, and, and part of us is we can only catch so much, and so we have to convert as much as we possibly can into new value streams. So, for example, we're doing some work with AgriSea on some of our fish waste into a product that they can put onto farms to, for better soil stuff. So there's, what are we doing around the value chain? I think it's, it's a lot harder in the deep sea um, uh, space because it's a lot of the work that, as I said, is around inshore, but we are owned by Moana, who are in turn owned by Te Hukai Moana. And in, in Moana's um, field, uh, mangroves and planting of those and the biodiversity around that and the, the, uh, the inshore um, nurseries for, for, um, for snapper or the like is going to be really critical. And its question is how do you actually engage with one around that sort of thing, go, well, what is the value in that? Is there's, there's, there's carbon, so, but there's biodiversity credits, and I think the, the, the faster that the New Zealand economy government um, works the way around how biodiversity credits can be valued um, is, is going to make a big difference in terms of how we get more involved in some of those, those inshore type things, um, specifically around carbon. Mm. Right, so... Um it seems to me kind of being across two different worlds, uh, so one is the private sector and how the consultancies work and what our clients saying, and the other one is the research community and what uh, some of the insights and the messages that you are sharing today. To me, everything that I'm dealing with at the moment and sort of observing that um, kind of unfolding seems like everyone is singing the same song, but at slightly different times. So it's not to say that we are you know, our uh, pathways are totally going the opposite directions. It's not that, it's, it's the same thing. But, you know, the language is different, the terminologies are different, the acronyms are different. 
And there are some communication barriers here that we can just, first of all, sort of be aware that, you know, they are there and they're going to be there. But sort of, you know, all the players that are in this equation should really take active steps towards actually, you know, stepping out of their, um, like, specialty area and reaching out to those other sectors and wanting to understand them. So I know that the businesses, um, some of them will just have to, but the other ones will really want to be kind of leaders in uh, climate and nature-related aspects. So they are already, if you think of that, they are already stepping out of, from the kind of mainstream line of business, wanting to understand how they interact with climate and how they interact with nature. Um, so obviously this is something totally new to them. They haven't dealt with all sorts of like ecology-related things that we are so deeply passionate about. So I think that what we can do um, as a scientific community is do the same thing and meet them somewhere halfway through. So um, maybe, yeah, and this is what really kind of resonated today out of some of those sessions that um, uh, we've, we've listened this morning, that um, the academic publication shouldn't be the final goal, but it's just the beginning. And then how do we work with the um, knowledge that we have to make it accessible to those people so it's readily applicable into um, action and meaningful change. I really like the uh, collagen example um, of taking the starfish and having an end product at the end of it um, that had been commercialised because that was that actually that actually took the science and all the way through. I thought that was pretty awesome. And how do you do that? Yes, more absolutely. Frequently? And uh, with that one, I want to comment on something else that I observed. That this is something almost like this. This was really exciting for me because it wasn't just another economic opportunity, but it was approaching a problem from a totally different perspective and um, sort of. It's totally different from the business as usual way of doing uh, any sort of economic activity. So if you think of a standard way of how one might approach this, could be, oh, you know, there's a starfish, we don't need them, let's check them out. And like, you know, this is a hammer, this is the nail, and you have only one tool. But this project shows us that there are different ways of actually conceptualizing <laughs> it and approaching it from the very beginning. So you're looking at that starfish thinking, okay, we, we want it, we don't want it there, it's disturbing, but like, can we do something about it? Can we create more value that is beyond the economic uh, gain or uh, economic advantage, but actually move towards those you know, social kind of values and cultural values and <coughs> generating that true uh, impact across so many different uh, domains. So yeah, really love that. All right, I'm gonna try to combine one of the questions that we had talked about with one that's on here as well, which is, do you, are there certain things that you have looked to looked at either here in New Zealand or around the world where you've seen that science making that impact and reach into driving blue economy change in a commercial setting or in that investment framework? Or is that something that you feel might be what we're missing? Can you repeat the question? So I guess the question is, where is the visibility of what's possible in bringing research and knowledge into commercial arenas to drive this blue economy ambition. Are there exemplars out there here within New Zealand, within your own businesses, or overseas? Or is that something that's actually fundamentally missing from our conversations? Ooh. I might have a crack at it. Um, and and look, the examples I give you may not be in the blue economy, but I think they can sort of show how if we've got the science and the data uh, and, and the method measurement methodologies, then you can uh, then, then, I'm, I'm approaching it from a financing perspective, but I, I think um, you, you can actually um, construct um, uh, financing that is outcomes based. And, and look, probably the simplest one I can describe would be the World Bank had a, um, a, a bond transaction in, in Africa that was called a rhino bond. And, and it was called a rhino bond because uh, the, the investment went in to support um, a conservation project and the investors' return was dependent on restoration of the rhino population. So that's probably a reasonably simple thing to understand where you know, if, if, the, if the outcome is successful, then, then, then the investors get re rewarded for their investment, and if it's not, then, then they, they share in the, I suppose, the pain of that outcome. Um, uh, you, you can get more complex ones. We're seeing blue, uh, blue financing uh, by, uh, we had a recent uh, conversation with, um, the Nordic Investment Bank in, uh, out of Scandinavia, where they were financing uh, uh, 
infrastructure, water infrastructure, which was really uh, aimed to prevent you know, um, pollution of, of the ocean. So, um, you know, that's again a re relatively simple sort of concept. And then you can go into much more complex uh, opportunities where, um, uh, in, in the social setting, um, I was involved in a social impact bond where the financing was to support an intervention around um, preventing uh, or, or reducing youth reoffending. Uh, so quite complex, took a, it was a pilot, and I, I'm a fan of pilots, which can test out innovation. Took a very innovative approach out of Canada, applied it in the New Zealand setting, and we're sort of coming to the end of that, of that, of that process, but it's been hugely successful. And from that, you collect data, and that data can actually help you work out, is this something that we can then uh, take forward and expand, or if it doesn't work, then I suppose you've got some learnings on why it didn't work. So perhaps I'd sort of suggest that there are opportunities to be innovative, but perhaps you started off in a small setting in a pilot and use that to to test your learnings and see whether uh, what you thought might be a good idea actually works. Mm. The only example I can think of is, and I can't remember, we're doing, I'm part of the ARTRL circle, we're doing a seafood sector adaptation strategy, thinking about where we're going to be around climate change and developing climate adaption pathway. So if this happens, this should happen, if this happens. So to try to address some of the things around snapper moving down the country and what does that mean around quota. But one of the examples that the guy who was running was in the, the transitioning um, uh, uh, fishermen in the in the islands from going fishing to actually growing seaweed. So as a transition from the, the fish aren't going to be there, so you're going to find another income stream around that. So I think there are other examples from small scale to large scale. Um, yeah. Sorry, I didn't think of a better, I thought of a better example as you were talking. Oh, actually. fantastic. And, and it comes back to your question about biodiversity credits. Um, and uh, so the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, there's, there's been reef credits uh, established and what that was about was trying to <laughs> encourage um, uh, the catchment, the land catchment, or land owners to prevent sediment uh, runoff and and um, and uh, nitrogen runoff into the into the waterways that was impacting the reef, and uh, that was measured and then there was there was credits uh, delivered to those landowners who uh, prevented that runoff. So. Um, yeah, look, I think there are examples out there that we can learn from, um, uh, but again, it comes back to. The, the key seems to be you know, having the methodology and the data to support those developments. And I'll maybe summarise those uh, points. So like, yeah, my co-panelists did an excellent job providing actual examples. Um, how I see it is that um, it will be just really amazing if we could come up with some sort of way of encouraging or incentivizing that sort of behaviour and those blue economy initiatives. So that will become a second norm that you, you know, no one will actually question you know, why we are doing it, but it will be just like, you know, a systemic change that will be so widespread and uh, we wouldn't need to think about singular examples here and there, but it will be just like yet another way of uh, doing the economy that will be our main mainstream way of doing marine economy. Right. I'm going to jump tech and read over here again, so apologize. I feel like I'm turning my back to you when I yeah, read yeah, the screen. Okay. Yeah. But, um, So this, it, it sort of builds up, and you've touched on it a little bit um, already, Dean, but says, how can we encourage investment in the ocean for the wider gains as well as traditional economic interns, returns, such as averted threat returns? So how do you in encourage that investment in wider gains? What are those pull factors, I'm guessing, is where I, I think that there is... Um, there is a pool of capital, a growing pool of capital out there that wants to support um, um, you know, environmental um, sustainability, um, and so, so, so I think that there, there is there is the funding there. Um, what, what's the incentive? I think you know clearly there's going to be um, commercial decisions around you know whether certain uh, projects and businesses are. Yeah, uh, are commercially viable from a financing point of view. But the overlay we're, we're seeing, and I think it's going to become more and more apparent, is that um, whether it's from a financing perspective or simply from a uh, from a uh, an access to to market. So you know, if, we, if we're a large exporter and, and consumers globally are starting to look at the practices that are, are being deployed to to produce 
products. And so um, I, I see that as, as, as sort of, you know, the, the incentives are there, I think. Um, uh, and, you know, the, um, the direction of travel from all stakeholders is expecting that, um, you know, the, 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 the way that we um, uh, produce our products and the, and the integrity of those products is going to be paramount. So um, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered the, answer the question mm -hmm. specifically, but I, th but I do feel that uh, yeah. those things are starting to line up and, and there's different stakeholders with different views, but um, I think they're pushing in the same direction. Yeah. To me, what um, I see kind of on the market and without kind of uh, sort of generalizing it too much, but there are two different types of how different organizations approach uh, the climate related issues or the nature related issues. And that's one is from the compliance side so if we talk about those organizations or firms, uh, mm. these are the companies that are motivated by just the fact that they have to meet the legal requirements. So if that's the case, if that's the major driver, then this is something what the government can step in and actually uh, mandate um, the disclosures, for instance. So that was something what was uh, done last year and next year. Um, those uh, big institutions, it, it's over uh, 200, I think, in New Zealand, will have to um, disclose their um, risks and opportunities and impacts in the scenario analysis uh, against uh, climate. So um, that's one side of the equation. Uh, the other one is uh, working with those institutions that are proactively looking towards engaging in those uh, great kind of outcomes. So they want to demonstrate that they are leaders in this space. So how I see that is that um, Organizations such as KPMG or the other kind of environmental consultancies can really, you know, help those uh, organizations on that journey by uh, joining them in uh, helping them to define what is the strategic leadership even in, in that sort of uh, nature space or um, ocean space. Um, so there are those uh, two, two things that uh, I've observed. But the other one really is that, um, to me, when I've heard that statement was really shocking for me because if we think of um, that most of the um, kind of restoration activities, um, am I right that they are funded from the public uh, investment or the philanthropy? Correct me if I am wrong, but is this, is this the main source of uh, funding where it comes from? But actually about you know 90 something percent of capital in the world sits with the private sector. So that's a huge investment opportunity. So how do we tap into that pot of money to actually redirect the investment, even better, redirect the invest investment from the nature negative uh, activities towards those nature positive activities? It's really something what we should focus on because this is where the biggest impact sits. Uh, no, I, I agree. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, the the bank the banks have got a massive role to play, to actually a perhaps lower their risk profiles to allow more riskier things to be funded, or incentivise. I'm having a go <laughs> here. Um, or, or give incentives, reasonable incentives in terms of interest rates to allow people to invest in things to enable that to be overcome, so that small organizations can take on those 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 bets equally how do the small organizations work with bigger companies like sea lord or sanford or moana to actually make things happen and and work out what the win-win is to actually um, benefit out of that and you know whether it's biodiversity credits for for a moana to be able to offset their carbon credits so they can be carbons carbon zero that that could be, that could be something of value um, that actually, if I'm going to build on your comment, because it segues into one of these here, is that do you feel confident as sustainability advisors, or as a company, I would guess, um, to encourage your clients or companies to invest in restorative actions such as benthic restoration? So we're talking about risk. Is it still too risky in your eyes, or would you be confident to start advising clients, yeah, this is this is where we need to be going with investments. Mm. Yeah, I'm trying to kind of think of how do I want to start so I don't get lost halfway through. Um, 
Okay, so the immediately what came to my mind was uh, one of the uh, points that Sarah Seller made during her presentation that as much as we actually want uh, to be driven by you know the non-financial benefits from the restoration project because we know that this is the right thing to do, we know that it benefits our culture, our economies, sorry, not ec economies, financial, but our cultures, our societies, well-being, you know, just the fact that we can just walk on the beach, uh, enjoy the, the beautiful landscape and the scenery. Unfortunately, at this point in time, this doesn't seem to be enough to convince a lot of those uh, business as usual kind of companies that are still driven by the financial return. So I think that to us, this is a good, um, this is an opportunity really, because um, it's something what we can use as, a, as an entry point or as a trigger to work with those uh, companies to, towards achieving those more holistic kind of understanding of um, what's the kind of return from the investment. And as uh, one of the comments was, uh, uh, the question was asked after that session, can we start motivating those uh, clients or organizations with the reputational gain, uh, the, com yeah, the legal kind of um, costs maybe associated with that? So that's almost like a secondary line, but still like if we can make a business case uh, that there is a financial return from any of the restoration project that also provides all sorts of environmental benefits or social benefits, then to me that's almost like a win-win. But the other very important thing to enable that movement is if we can actually um, come up with sets of KPIs or measures, uh, whatever the terminology we want to kind of use in that context to actually understand what are the results from our restorative actions. And it's not just about, you know, what the success looks like, how do we succeed, but to give those organizations anything um, that will speak about what actually comes out of it, whether that's qualitative, whether that's the story, whether that, that's something alongside, uh, along, uh, along the lines of Tao, Maori, um, you know, stories and um, those uh, much uh, deeper uh, ways of explaining kind of wider context of social, cultural kind of setting. So if we can come up with something that we can present uh, to those, the, to the private sector, to the business community around those measures and um, from the restorative actions could be really powerful uh, in terms of moving towards the future and uh, shaping that future for uh, blue economy. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question because um, uh, it's hard to generalize because it depends on, on the project and how big a project this is relative to the size of the, of the company and how much risk they're taking in terms of that one project. It probably comes back to my earlier point that I think there's uh, some real value in, in pilots, and I, and, I, and I sort of was thinking about uh, the example would be uh, Naitahu uh, running their um, pilot on regenerative agriculture and actually making that data available and running sort of parallel farms side by side. And so that type of activity is, is really valuable because it provides information that others can then follow on from. Um, I don't necessarily think that uh, the, this type of activity is necessarily going to be uh, high risk in each case and, and, and certainly I think what we're seeing is um, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly opportunities from, from the change that comes out from that but often there's a, a transition period and, and that, that period may be where um, there, there's a need for some um, incentives possibly to be provided to, to help to, uh, transition from perhaps one land use change to another or one business chain uh, type to another. So yeah, it, it's, it's sort of a, there's some complexity in there, but I think um, I would say that uh, you know, uh, there is some significant opportunity there as well. So I, I think it talked about the risk uh, and, and we have to be conscious of that, but um, I think the opportunity is also uh, needs to be um, yeah, and I think measured. speaking of the risk, uh, also to add to your point, there's a risk of not taking action as well, which often yep. can be that uh, motivator, essentially, or being behind your competitors. Um, so this is, yeah, the risk of just not doing anything can be enough to actually mobilize. Yeah, I just want to add one thing. Um, so I had the privilege of going on a Cambridge University course on climate and sustainability and the like, and I walked away from it going, um, we all have to move really fast. We can't, we can't 
we can't slow down. You've got to move as fast as you possibly can and start to think about how you're going to transition your businesses or transition what we do to, to enable ourselves to be well set up for the future because it's coming at us and it's coming at us fast. And as humans, we, we only... We only do it when it starts to impact on us versus before it does. And I think we've seen examples around the Motu recently where it's starting to impact, climate's starting to impact us. You know, the, doing the power baseline, we've missed the opportunity to do that. We need, we need, to, we need to move fast. We need to move fast. Yeah. Um, we've got some really interesting questions, all of, and, and everything from Rangatira Tonga. I didn't say that right. Rangatira Tonga. Um, around global connectivity and positioning around financing roundtables. There's a whole lot of um, kind of where, how do we start taking this forward kind of conversations. Um, one thing I'd, in, in order for any of, um, I shouldn't say any of, we've talked a lot about the collaboration, we've talked a lot about of opportunity, we've talked about de-risking. Where is the leadership going to come from, do you think, that's going to have the biggest impact on blue economy growth and transitions? Uh, this, this group? Yeah. <laughs> well, well at, the end of the, at the end of the day, everyone sitting in this room are, are passionate about what they're doing and, you know, I'm, mm. you get, I get overwhelmed by the, the people that are talking to you about all the amazing stuff you do. It's, it's all the people in this group and, mm. and groups like it to make sure that we are leading the way around changing what we're doing. And it's, it's got a, everyone's got a role to play, right? The, the challenge we have, I think, within my observation would be there is lots of stuff going on in different areas. Uh, MPI are doing something and fisheries are doing something and the scientists doing something over here. And how do we link it all in together, I think, is a big challenge. Singing one song at the same time. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, look, I think it's, uh, in a sense, it, it, it is happening. I mean, I, I think it's, um, it, it can be get lost. Um, perhaps the messaging doesn't get out, but when I, I was just sort of thinking um, when I, I can remember uh, when we signed the um, free trade agreement with the EU, uh, one of the comments that uh, Damien O'Connor made was, look, uh, part of that agreement was really ensuring that there was a sustainability aspect to, to what they import. And, his message was, you know, if we want to retain market access, then we need to you know, embrace that. And so, yeah, I think, you know, the way that I, uh, that, that I think about this is this is, this is a global mega trend that, 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 that's, that's well and truly underway. Um, history tells us that, you know, businesses and economies that embrace these mega trends uh, and get on board tend to prosper, and those that don't, well, don't do so well. So I think. Um, but when I think about it from, from the New Zealand point of view, from a regulatory point of view, we, there's been a number of regulatory settings that uh, have set a, set a message and, uh, and a signal. I think that's been helpful. Um, I think there's clear consumer trends in place that are sending a, a supportive signal as well. I think from a, from a bank, you now obviously the banks are a mechanism for financing the economy and the signal we get from, from uh, investors who invest and provide us that funding globally is, they're looking for us to, to make progress as well. So from what, where I sort of sit, um, you know, we're seeing uh, some very clear signals coming from all, all these different stakeholders to, that, that we need to embrace this. And, and, and I, I don't pretend for a moment this is easy because it's a, a big change, but I think um, uh, yeah, those signals are, are well and truly um, aligned, I believe. I think that if we if it if it comes to actually thinking about a definition of leadership um, in the sustainability space, I think that we've long time well, not so long time ago, but like we've moved uh, beyond that leadership to be sustainable is no longer a good leadership, and that leadership will be it, it's a continuously evolving <coughs> definition, but it's definitely going to be in something that is more about generating the value beyond sustainability. So all the nature positive solutions, adding value to the ecosystems, not just depleting them or making uh, it equal. So, um, yeah, I think that what's um, kind of really encouraging and what can be our sort of entry point into building that sort of definition of the leadership with the organizations from the uh, perspective of the management consultancy um, is the task force on nature related disclosures. So, um, this is something what can really uh, 
kind of stir some movement in, in, the, in this space and actually help those businesses to sort of start getting interested in that. And again, working with those early adopters um, can be really exciting because this is, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, uh, guys that are in high positions uh, in their organizations or board representatives or sitting at the ELTs um, who are really passionate about nature uh, or oceans. Uh, it just depends on what sort of their background is. But this is something what is really exciting from our perspective because if we can work with some organization like this, then we can really make that huge impact into shaping what that leadership uh, in the sustainability and also including nature, oceans, climate, can really look like and it can start um, kind of getting that, you know, more real shape. But everything at n right now, it's still a work in progress, so it's constantly evolving. We are um, having more information almost uh, from month to month, like more updates are released. So we are still kind of trying to get up to speed and be on that journey. But it, it is, um, this is how as well, like the power of collaboration comes uh, and becomes really kind of, uh, you know, powerful and really important because no one can, uh, you know, be a leader on their own anymore. So we really need to come together, initiate that dialogue, whether that's between private sector and science uh, or a wider kind of, uh, you know, bringing the governmental organizations, the NGOs together and work together towards defining that leadership in, in the complex kind of uh, world that we, we get to function. Thank you. Um, I know I, we're down into the red zone up here on the clock. Um, but I think that's a fantastic place for us to end with a real um, recognition, I guess, and a call, um, a call to action for all of us is that, that leadership as well and everything that we're doing through that challenge comes through the work that we all do on a day-to-day -day basis. And that the more that we collaborate, the bigger and the faster we can make that impact and drive the change that we're all after. Um, one of the things that I think comes with that and what I also want to acknowledge with our panel is that um, the first time I spoke with each of you, you all said, I don't know what I'm gonna add because I'm not a scientist. And sometimes it takes us getting outside of our comfort zone and becoming vulnerable and sharing our true, you know, our true stories and what we're up to for us to start to build those connections and really catapult ourselves forward. So a huge thank you to our panelists um, and I'm, I think I'm passing it back over to Pai. I just want to acknowledge that I still consider myself a scientist by oh, sorry. background, so <laughs> <laughs> this is where my heart is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jody, and, and thank uh, thank you to the panel. Uh, it was a very um, engaging conversation, and, and definitely some compelling reasons why we need to start thinking about what we do uh, quite differently, and whether that means that uh, we take a punitive approach where we punish people for not being good kaitiaki, or whether we incentivise them to be good kaitiaki is definitely a conversation that we need to happen. But I think, you know, as a, as a general observation, people know that we need to do something a lot quicker than what we're doing at, at present. So uh, thank you all. Uh, it's been a great afternoon. And look, that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, and apologies, look, the bill, um, Kay Blake was meant to provide our summary or reflections of today. Bill has, is not able to be here, um, but... Uh, oh. You guys didn't have to point out that he was here. That just told everybody that I don't know who Bill is. <laughs> Kia ora, Bill. But you're not doing the summary, are you? We've got two. I'm looking over to Julie here, like Julie. Hey. Wow. Well, there you go. <laughs> I come from a place that talks about being a river, and I am the river, and the river is me like a river. We go with the flow. So as a result of that, I've got two bios to read one that I've scribbled on, but I'm going to read through my scribble so I can tell you all about Bill the Economist. Bill is an economist at NZIA. 
He has a long record of research, uh, long record of research and consultancy in primary industries. Uh, he was previously chief economist at PwC New Zealand, where he contributed to consultant projects in Australia, China, New Zealand, and the United States. He has been an honorary associate professor at Lincoln University. Bill takes a very pragmatic approach to research using economic tools and methods. Bill, you come up here while I introduce Stephen. Stephen, you're here. Just checking. <laughs> Stephen, the late ring-in. Uh, Stephen heads the Pacific Ocean and Fisheries team um, at the Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He has been a career diplomat for 20 years and was a journalist here and overseas for 20 years before that. From 2018 to the arrival of COVID-19, Stephen was seconded to the Commonwealth as the Special Envoy for the Blue Charter, 10 areas of ocean action to, to address marine depletion across the 56 members of the Commonwealth. He spent all of 2021 on secondment to the Ministry of Health as Group Manager for COVID-19 Strategy and Policy and began his new role this year. He lives in Wellington where he is a keen sailor, diver and sea swimmer. Let's give it up for these two to round off our day. Kia ora, thank you. Um, wonderful representation of a river. Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, no Amerika aho, e noho ana o ki tāhuna ki te Waiponamu, e mahi ana aho ki te New Zealand Institute of Economic Research, ko Bill K. Blake tōku ingoa, nā mihi ki a koutou. Uh, I was asked to do some reflections on the day, and um, I can see that I've got a timer, so um, I kind of had two choices. And I'm going to go for the funhouse mirror reflection first, so I don't run out of time. Um, in the challenge, I'm running a synthesis project. It's based on the blue economy, but part of what we're doing is trying to understand the synthesis across uh, EBM and Teo Maori and blue economy. Um, and today, I've been listening to uh, these presentations and discussions, and to me, they're hitting at two levels. There's a micro level where we're hearing about all of the really great work and the really great science and the things that are being developed that, that really can develop a blue economy. You know, we're seeing the actual evidence that a blue economy in the future is possible because we're seeing its, its, its ex existence now. And the, the panel talked about the uh, Patanga Roa as, as the great example of that. But the funhouse mirror uh, reflection for me is at the macro level. So in preparing for, our, um, for the project that we're doing, we looked at some of the blue economy work that's already been done in the challenge. And one of the things that struck us was the aspirations in that research that's been done. There's just an amazing aspiration to see a different economy. Um, and, and as the discussion this morning talked about, to get to that aspiration, we need different structures. We need different social structures. We need different um, governmental structures or different participation by government um, because the, the economic activity depends on the society and the culture and government and as well as the environment. And um, listening to it today, um, I, I was reminded of the, the show, um, Whose Line Is It Anyway? And I don't know if you remember, but at the beginning of the show, it says uh, where the rules are made up and the points don't matter. And what I thought about today was in the economy, the points really do matter, but the rules are still made up. Um, and I want to remind you about Mickey Mouse. Um, if you had handed somebody a drawing of Mickey Mouse and you had told them, this is going to be valuable in 100 years, they would have said, come on, really? But Steamboat Willie first appeared in 1928, and that was the first appearance of Mickey Mouse on the, you know, on the screen. And Disney is still defending its copyright and trademark. Disney is still defending that asset today, almost 100 years later. 
And one of the things we heard today was, oh, you know, we're really worried about the value of these assets and people's decision time frames. They're only five years, it's only 10 years. What are we going to do? Well, let me tell you, Mickey Mouse has been valuable for 100 years. Our ecosystems, we should place the same value on them. We should make up the rules that have the value, have that kind of value. The other bit of the fun house, as the clock ticks down, is about um, the banking sector. Uh, when the global financial crisis happened, um, there was a lot of kind of navel gazing about the economy. Um, Craig, uh, my colleague Craig Pritchard, ran a, a conference, um, and I presented a paper there about the global financial crisis. And one of the things I pointed out was that that crisis split risk and reward. So the bankers, the hedge funds, they took all this risk and it blew up in their faces, but they didn't have to pay for it. They got paid out. The, um, the, the bonuses to hedge fund managers the year after the GFC was larger than all of the government bailout money. They took that money from the government, from the taxpayers, and they paid it out to their mates. So, and, and right now we're, you know, we're seeing another banking crisis happening. We've seen banks, uh, there have been a few banks falling over, and it's the same thing. Those banks are being bailed out by government money. So don't tell me that the money's not there. Don't tell me that we have to wait for the investors to feel like there's enough money for them to get their returns. At a macro level, the money's there. We just have to get it out of them. We just have to show that it's important enough that the money has to go into those, into those um, uh, endeavors. Now, I might lose my license as an economist for saying these sorts of things, but it's the absolute truth if you look at the system as it is. So that's my funhouse mirror reflection as the timer hits zero. Thank you. Kia ora. Kia ora, Bill. Kia ora, Pahia. Nga mihi, kia koutou. Uh, ko rangi toto te maunga, ko Waitemata, te Moana, ko Duchess of Argyle, te Waka, ko Stephen Harris, toko ingoa. Nō no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, I'm Stephen Harris, as you know from the introduction. Um, I wanted to start with uh, this graphic because that's, that's my workplace. That's what I look out the window each day to do. And I think it's a reminder of just the vastness of Moana Nui Akiwa and how interconnected we all are. Those, those kind of egg white effects around the countries are the exclusive economic zones of the, of the Pacific Island countries. And as you can see, in some cases, you can see the sea, but you can't see the land that sits in the middle and gives, gives those exclusive economic zones there, uh, their connection. Um, I'm not going to try and um, do much in four minutes. Um, I did try to take down a lot of uh, content when I was asked to, uh, to do this uh, uh, slight uh, reflections thing at the end of the day, and there's a lot of words in there, so I'm not going to try to do that. I'm just going to rush through. Um, and reflect on a couple of things. And one of the things I thought um, would be useful is to just put down some key words that I've heard during the day. They've, these things have resonated. Um, we heard uh, Tom Mark Solomon talk about balance, and that word has bounced around in a number of contexts during the day. Integration, absolutely critical. Um, it's about um, not just uh, a demarcation at the coastline, it's about the connection between the whenua and Moana, and we've heard a lot about that today. Again, um, Tam Mark's, Mark talked about um, from, from the river down to Tangaroa, and we heard the minister talk about estuaries. So we're getting that sense that um, all these things are interrelated, and we need to find solutions that are going to address all the uh, interrelated aspects of it. Indigenizing, uh, quite a bit of kōrero about uh, what we mean by that, and later on, how we actually get uh, more than intrinsic value out of it. We actually get some uh, commercial value out of it. Uh, that's the space I work in, international recognition, and someone made the, made the comment that we need to make sure that this sits behind some of the labelling, some of the acknowledgement that we're going to get out, which is uh, out of the international marketplace that's going to add value to it. Space. Um, 
again, a discussion around um, what we mean by, uh, or what our, what our alternative uses might be of the space. Um, there's uh, obviously discussion around marine spatial planning, but uh, you know, whose values are going to determine how that space is allocated? Uh, it seems um, a bit of a no-brainer when, when we're farming about 60 square kilometres of our 15,000 kilometre coastline and we have over 4 million square kilometres of uh, territorial waters, but um, we still uh, are going to have to have those sorts of conversations to reconcile different values. Um, regenerative, yes, um, that was a very strong theme, uh, theme throughout the day, uh, but regeneration takes time, it takes risk and it takes money and we've heard quite a bit of discussion today about how we're going to um, incentivise making some of the right decisions. We know they're right but they take time, they don't have an upfront return and somehow we have to find the instruments and the motivation and the supporting regulatory framework to lead us in the right direction. Um, the, the, the notion of place, this is very localised, of course, you know, um, but the ocean moves around, so how are we going to make those connections? Um, Trade-offs, uh, does it necessarily mean that uh, one, one win is going to be another loss, or can we look at the notion of, of, of trade-ins as well, or, or reinforcing uh, as we would do with circular economy principles? How do we achieve scale? Um, this is about momentum as well as spreading the good ideas, vulnerability, um, we're, we're talking about fragile ecosystems and how do we buttress those, how do we get them protected in, in law um, and uh, of course uh, in all, all the ways that we approach it. Data. We need the data to drive decisions. Without, um, without good data, we're going to be um, second guessing a lot of the time and we won't be able to put priorities on things. Collaboration and coordination is absolutely critical and of course there is, um, this is why we're here, we're trying to work out what our connections are going to be and how we can work together to try to come up with the right priorities. And um, finally, uh, there's, there's the notion of, of a vision. We, we've heard today, uh, someone asked the Minister about um, whether there's going to be an oceans policy and in his answers there was I think there was a sense that we've tried to do this before, it's pretty hard, but um, we need to do it again. Um, I've run out of time now, there's a lot more information that, that sits behind that, but um, I'd just like to sort of pick up on, on the point that the panel uh, ended on before, which is about leadership and asking ourselves what's our role in trying to bring together some of the new ideas that are going to take, uh, take this into a, a dynamic new space. Thank you. Thank you both uh, for a great summary of, of today's um, hui. It's been a long day, hasn't it? Uh, it's been a long day, and I do want to uh, firstly thank you all uh, for uh, your attention and your perseverance staying here throughout the day. I've noticed a couple of people there doing the old, there's nothing worse when you try and do that really sneaky yawn and you do the and you pull those most unusual facials as you're trying to do it so no one else around you knows that you're tired, but it has been a long day. But look, I want to thank you all. I want to thank all of our presenters today. Um, leadership um, is left wanting when we start to talk about uh, the blue economy, that's for sure. But today, um, for somebody who's not actively involved in this space, I have a strong assurance that there's huge leadership that's sitting in this room and it has to begin with all of us. Us as individuals, us as parents, as partners, we all have to lead and demonstrate uh, the behaviours uh, and the attitudes that we want to see. And so uh, very heartening and um, real privileged to be part of today. So look, um, before I hand over to, uh, to Matua Joe to uh, close us up uh, for the day, uh, tomorrow morning we've got a, uh, an early start, 11 o'clock. <laughs> no, just having you on, Julie. Um, 8.30, 8.30 we'll be kicking off um, with a presentation um, which was meant to be a keynote address, um, but um, our keynote speaker's not able to be here, but that will be done um, via uh, a video. Uh, uh, 
pre-recorded uh, presentation. So looking forward to catching up with you all uh, tomorrow morning um, at 8.30. Please enjoy your evening, have a good sleep, and we'll see you here bright and ready to go tomorrow. Kei a koe tu matua. Sorry, my apologies. Julie just said to me, Pahi, you forgot that last prompt on your run sheet. Man, that's loud, bro. Um, so, these, the drinks and poster session downstairs in the cable room. Um, encourage you all to, uh, to talk to each other. Um, just to let you know uh, that the poster presenters will be by their poster boards between 6 and 6.30 this evening. So please make your way downstairs, grab yourself a drink and enjoy each other's company. Kia ora tato.